Welcome. Welcome to the Wonka um, Special Interest Group presentation on making sense of complexity of complexities of COVID-19 in primary care. The emergence of a coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID-19 epidemic, with novel characteristics has made it highly infectious and particularly dangerous for an older age group and people with multiple morbidities. This has brought our complex adaptive system, society, the economy, health systems and individuals to a virtual standstill, at least at times. Family doctors are on the front line of medical care, both during the acute phase and also in dealing afterwards with the biological, psychological and social economic sequelae of the illness. In this presentation, we present four streams. First, a complex systems perspective that looks at, ex, explores the nature of coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. A micro level perspective on the consultation, meso level perspectives on minority health in the COVID-19 pandemic, and macro level perspectives on evidence and policy. I'd now like to in, uh, introduce you to our Wonka president who has a pre-recorded message. Dr. Donald Lee will now speak. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Thank you for taking time during your busy schedule to attend the second series of Wonka webinars. Family doctors around the world have risen to the challenge of this awful pandemic. In the midst of the massively increased workload for family doctors, I'm proud of the level of support and collegiality displayed within and across our member organizations and from region to region. It is heartening indeed. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic is bringing a lot of changes to our professional and personal lives. We are slowly adapting to the use of technology to overcome barriers and challenges created by the pandemic. We are getting used to meet virtually and using the cyberspace like what we're doing now. Colleagues are disseminating scientific advice, clinical updates, reflective messages, and professional support through their social media links and connections. They're keeping in touch with each other regularly, like family members, relaying information, urging courage in these extraordinary times. I think all those who participated or listened in our various webinars held in June and July will agree they have been well received and appreciated by many fam family doctors around the world. I'm really looking forward to the next series of webinars, which will include presentations from our working party and special interest groups on health equity, women and family medicine, e-health, aging and health, complexities, mental health, palliative care, adolescent and young adults, as well as the environment. Before I hand it over to the convener of this webinar, I would like to say that unfortunately, this is a pandemic with an unknown end game. I wish each and every one of our family doctors well during this time. Use the best advice available, work collaboratively with your teams, do the best you can for your patients. You should stand proud of your contributions in facing the world crisis. No one knows what will be ahead of us in the weeks, but everybody knows enough to understand that COVID-19 will test our capacities to be kind and generous and to see beyond ourselves and our interests. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. May we all proceed with wisdom and grace. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce you to our speakers. Um, and they're, only, they're going to give a little wave when I say their names. I'm Carmel Martin. I'm from the Wonka uh, SIG in Complexity and I'm the current chair. Arkham, Joachim Sternberg, who is co-chair and ex-chair um, from Australia, Bruno Kisling from Switzerland, and Denise Campbell-Shearer from Canada. Uh, there are more bios in the chat, 
So if you want to know a bit more about us, you can have a look there. So globally, the medical profession summarized the situation this way. We have all witnessed death, disease and mental distress at levels not seen for decades. These effects could have been partially mitigated or possibly even prevented by adequate investments in pandemic preparedness, public health and environmental stewardship. We must learn from these mistakes and come back stronger, healthier and more resilient. So it's a worldwide problem. And COVID challenges, COVID-19 challenges our notion of equity. How do we balance the short-term health impacts on older and vulnerable populations against the long-term health-related life chances of young and fit healthy adults related to the associated deteriorating economic circumstances? So it's a question of balancing computing demands. So in this webinar, we're going to explore the nature of selected problems for family doctors in the COVID-19 era and emerging sense-making and strategies going forward. We're going to look at clinical care, health and social service systems and the political, not so much economic um, systems in which we operate. So we're going to explore this um, and the nature of systems and systemic problems complexities in the consultation, making sense of community issues, the Kinefin, or Kinefin framework and sense maker in Edmonton, Canada at the meso level and complexities in policy making, primary care versus general policy issues. Wonka officially recognizes the global pandemic emergency, yet there are many wicked problems and tensions and contradictions among approaches that make a straightforward evidence-based approach impossible. The COVID-19 pandemic is a typical wicked problem. We did not see it coming, we experienced its effects and it challenges our entrained ways of thinking and acting. Wicked problems in family medicine. COVID-19 is a wicked problem and there are many known known unknowns, unknown knowns and known unknowns. We yet do not know enough about the virus, but we are painfully learning. The true mode and speed of infectivity is population dynamics and treatment. We do not know enough about the risk to the population as a whole and any subpopulation, age groups, behavioral risk takers and those with pre-existing morbidities. We did not have a ready to go pandemic plan who is in charge, what are proven population control measures, what advice to provide for protection to people and health professionals and public health services, what are potentially effective treatments. Such problems are known as VUCA problems. They entail volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. Resolving such problems requires VUCA understanding vision, understanding, clarity and agility. VUCA problems place health and political leaders in a difficult position as any decision will have difficult to foresee consequences. For example, imposing community-wide isolation or self-isolation that entails that almost all activities stop, destroying the economy and resulting in high unemployment, poverty and increasing chronic disease burden in other dimensions, while implementing strategies to slow down the spread of an infection will not guarantee we will not overwhelm health systems or stabilize the pandemic. I now, Ockham Sternberg is now going to give an overview of systems. Thank you, Carmel, and welcome everyone. Let's first demystify the fancy term system. In the first instance, it is useful to distinguish system thinking from system sciences. System thinking is a mental approach to understanding the world and its phenomena in their unique context. The tools to achieve this understanding are provided by a whole suite of system science methodologies. 
the way we think about the world and we see and experience has dramatically changed over time. While some have been universally rejected, like the Earth is flat, others persist and compete with each other. 17th century thought was dominated by classical rationalism. The key idea being that knowledge is acquired from the intellect, imagination, sense of perception, and memory. The emphasis here was on developing and adhering to a rigorous scientific method of taking the object of study apart into separate parts and separating out the spiritual, which was belonging to the church, from the physical, which was belonging to the scientist. The mind-body split to a large extent persists and it's associated with, with René Descartes and the cause and effect mode of linear and proportional thinking. The late enlightenment thinking of the late 18th and early 19th century realized that the reductionist thinking so successful in the mechanistic world failed to describe the living world. The emphasis to understand the living world must focus on the interconnectedness and interdependencies between the parts. The moment system thinking was born. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe and Alexander von Humboldt's insights laid the foundation of system sciences. Shifting from the mechanistic system understanding of the parts shaping the whole to an organic systems understanding of the whole shaping the parts. Cause and effect relationships typically show divergent behaviors and any cause can have multiple effects on the system as a whole. So to put it in a nutshell, and this is really all you ever need to know about systems is encapsulated by Russ Aikoff's um, uh, two insights. The system is a whole that cannot be divided into independent parts and the system's properties are not present in its parts. These two characteristics determine a system's three key behaviors. A system is a whole that contains two or more parts, each of which can affect the properties and behaviors of the whole. None of them has an inter independent effect on the whole how any part affects the whole depends on what other parts are doing. And thirdly, the parts are all interconnected and between any two parts of a system, there's a direct and an indirect pass as indicated by the right panel in the figure. Consequently, a system is not a sum of, uh, consequently, a system is not a sum of behaviors of its parts. Rather, it is a product of the interactions. <coughs> An expansion of this generic system definition is that of complex adaptive systems. Complex adaptive systems learn from the interactions and in response to this learning, adapt and reconfigure their parts, relationships, and dynamic interactions. Importantly, this is not a random process. <coughs> Complex adaptive systems consist of subsystems, while at the same time being part of a larger supersystem and are interconnected across the scales. A change at any point in the system has reverberations across the system as a whole. Two processes control the dynamics of the complex adaptive system. Top-down causation transfers information from higher system levels to lower ones, which constrain the work that lower system levels can do. That is, it limits the system's bottom-up emergence possibilities. If top-down constraints are too tight, <coughs> they can bring the system to a standstill. 
System stability also depends on the law of requisite variety, meaning that a system must have a sufficient repertoire of responses or capacity for self-organization that is at least as nuanced and numerous as a problem surviving within the, its environment. If the possible ways <coughs> of responding are fewer than what is demanded from the system, it will fail in its entirety. How can we translate the system theory into practice? We are going to limit the discussions here to Kurtz and Snowden's Kunevin framework as a means to highlight the various ways of understanding the same problem. Each of the four domains of the framework represent a different form of understanding, and it allows for multiple <coughs> perspectives to be seen and understood regardless of one's own preferred perspective. At a pragmatic level, using sense-making as a pragmatic tool helps collective understanding of the problem arising from multiple perspectives. Understanding where in the Conovin framework a particular aspect resides enhances us, uh, enables us to use particular strategies that will help to move the issue to a strategically more amenable state. Managing system, systemic complexity provide, uh, managing systemic complex problems is tricky at the best of time. Importantly, these problems have no single right or wrong answer. This very recent figure shows that how the perceptions of attitudes like skepticism and the pace of change versus a degree of urgency can result in the extremes of medical nihilism or hawkish interventionism. Both extremes are undesirable if they do not allow for ongoing observation, evaluation of new data and information, and critical reflection of an intervention on the system as a whole the patient's health, public risk, or impacts on resources and social equity. System thinking and system sciences tools allow us to find the best adapted solution to a problem. Complex interconnections and interdependencies lead to pattern outcomes. To understand those patterns, one often has to work backwards asking the question, what and how did various agents contributing to the problems we see? SARS-CoV-2 is necessary to cause COVID-19, the disease, but by itself, it's not sufficient. Many other factors modulate and uh, the transition from infection to disease. Equally, Many different factors are involved in resulting in various severity patterns, treatment responses and treatment failures. It would appear to us that the maintenance of approaches that were indicated at the beginning of the pandemic are now counterproductive. Politics and policies have not adapted to our rapidly emerging pieces of information and they have not been translated into a transparent picture of knowledge. As Kane said, when my information changes, I alter my conclusions. What do you do, sir? Sticking with the same failed approaches and expecting a different outcome is, as Einstein put it, the ultimate definition of insanity. We hope that using system thinking approaches uh, will help to come up quickly with better solutions to the problems we have. Hello, let's look now at the practical side of all this complexity. The COVID-19 pandemic is a bio, psycho, social, ecological masterpiece of complexity, uncertainty, and ambivalence. 
All decisions are always made in the context of great uncertainty, as well as within an environment characterized by fear and confusion. And all decisions will be scrutinized in the public eye. Each decision with serious consequences and unintended side effects, be it fatal health outcomes, number of deaths, the collapse of the health system or socio-economical harms. Next slide, please. Um, may somebody help me to change the slide? Let's look at the characteristics that make SARS-CoV-2 so uncertain. It's a newly emerged virus. We know only a few about its, its properties and behaviors. There is much information emerging very quickly, but often contradictory. Research is scarcely coordinated. A colorful bunch of experts provide often contradictory advice. Politicians not uncommonly deflect this advice according to their not so transparent political intentions. As a consequence, strange beliefs, fake news and mistrust circulate in the social media. Fear affects the mental health of many much more than potential physical consequences the disease can have. May I have the next slide, please, when I can have a help? Does somebody help me? I cannot change it. The next slide, yeah, Bruno. Bruno. Ah, yes. Um, let's consider the following case presentation about a person worried about having been infected with SARS-CoV-2. A 75 years old lady presents to your practice complaining about a new onset cough, but otherwise feels perfectly well. She has been visited by her teenage grandchildren over the weekend, all of whom were well. She had a recent heart attack, leaving her with a mild congestive cardiac failure and she has tablet controlled diabetes. She's also a risk person. And let's consider to see her in three different con contexts, maybe in New Zealand, Switzerland, and the USA, with very different case numbers, fatality rates, and death. You can see these numbers under the pictures. Zero in New Zealand, 3,000 active cases in Switzerland every day, 69,000 active cases in the US. May I have the next slide, please? It's what has to be discussed? What has to be discussed with this patient to find an answer for her within her context? On the one side, we have her questions to the context. How is the prevalence of the infection? How is the rate of transition? Not everybody who has the infection gets ill and not each, not each ill, um, and not who has the virus is tested positive. That does not mean that he will get ill also. And surely this person is, belongs to the risk population. On the, personal, on the personal level, you have to discuss with her the exposure. She met teenaged young people, which are often um, asymptomatic vectors of the infection. She will know if she needs a swab or not. And maybe she will know, can she prevent the disease by taking medications? All this is today, till today, very, very unsure. And maybe she wants to know if in case she gets ill, how will we do with her? Can she get admitted to the hospital when she needs it? 
Next slide, please. How can we best deal with the multiple interconnected and interdependent issues of this worried person during the COVID-19 pandemic? In a situation where context matters, culture matters, tacit, expect, tacit expectations matter. However, in the end, the fundamental mindset and the generic skills of family medicine provide the necessary tools to manage wicked problems in the most adaptive way. After all, family phys physicians, even though many are not necessarily aware of it, are the experts of dealing with volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, also, also with COVID-19. COVID Next slide, please. Family medicine has a well-established toolkit to manage any problem. Hence, I argue that COVID-19 is not different to any other uncertain problem presenting in family practice. The toolkit contains two approaches. First is to perform a, a methodical structured consultation which gives orientation to the patient and to the doctor. And second, to apply a systemic, solution-oriented and person-centered consultation. These approaches enable the doctor to engage the patient in finding solutions that are appropriate to the problem of the individual patient in his personal context. And at the same time, respond to the public health context of the COVID-19 pandemic in line with the governmental rules aimed to protect the public's health interests. Can I have the next slide? Let's just briefly review what we mean by a systemic solution-oriented and person-centered consultation. We see the patient as an autonomous person with resources and goals. The consultation is a meeting of experts on a level playing field. The patient is the expert of his illness, of the experience he makes with the disease. This is unique for him. May, may you go back? Please, may you go back? And Nick Monant back again. Sorry. Can you go back again? It's okay, Bruno. It's at the right slide for us. Yes, that's very good. And the doctor is the expert of the disease. This means of the biomedical phenomenon. The mutual recognition and respect of the different expertises empowers the patient, enhances his health esteem, his confidence his active cooperation, and last but not least, his health literacy. These are fundamental to the therapeutic process, resulting in healing, meaning the patient feeling whole again and in control of his or her destiny. Relation and trust are the essence of the therapeutic relationship. The attitudes of the doctor has to be empathy, unconditional positive regard to the patient, authenticity. Of course, he needs an up-to-date medical knowledge in his field. And other ingredients are active listening to the patient, asking questions that involve the patient in the therapeutic process, asking about the context, the resources, the emotions, ideas and concerns, the meaning of the patient about his illness, expectations, and not at least the mandate. The doctor has to get a mandate from the patient to make a therapeutic process. Often we go on without a, without a certain mandate. Together, the patient and the doctor 
we create a common reality. And this is the foundation to deal with uncertainty and ambivalence and to find to share decision making for goal oriented interventions. Dealing with a patient in such a solution oriented and person centered way will lead to common and satisfying answers of high quality, especially when the situation is very, very uncertain, like it is in COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. So now we're going to take it to the next ecological level and recognize that the patients are situated within community and they're acted upon by a number of other different forces that directly inf influence their health. So we're going to give an example of the application of sense making um, to the impacts of COVID-19 in vulnerable ethnocultural communities. So we'll go over the core concepts in the Kinevin framework for sense making uh, to orient us to the project. We're going to give a brief um, introduction to big, thick and rich data, uh, and then give an example of the COVID-19 project that we've been working on. Uh, I need to also acknowledge Cognitive Edge and uh, Dr. Dave's, uh, Professor Dave Snowden uh, for a lot of the ideas in this presentation, as well as generously sharing some of the slides. Next slide, please. So the, this is the Kinefin framework for those who may not have seen it. Um, it also has undergone a lot of change. This is the 21st uh, anniversary of Kinefin. There's actually a celebration going on right now about it. Um, so it's worthwhile to revisit it. And it means a sense of multiple belongings in Welsh, Welsh which is really relevant because it's um, a framework which uh, has multi ontologies to it. So it's a sense-making framework and, and the big aspect is to try to understand where your problem lies. So just to orient us to five domains, um, we have the ordered domains, which are on the right side of the figure, um, and then the complex domain in the upper left part of the figure and the chaotic domain in the lower uh, left part of the figure. And in the middle, we have the domain of confusion, which has uh, expanded and become quite interesting. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Next slide, please. So one really uh, uh, helpful way of thinking about these different domains is to think about the constraints. So in the bottom right domain, in the clear domain, that's a domain that's highly constrained. So um, an analogy in healthcare that I'll often think of is the, uh, you know, the operating theater. Um, so a lot of clear rules. You can also think about traffic going out to, to drive on the highway. So in those kinds of highly ordered, highly constrained domains, all behavior can be determined, forecast, predicted, and linear material relationships will exist between cause and effect. Um, this is a domain of best practice. This is a domain of safe surgical checklists. When we go into the other order domain, the complicated domain, we still have governing constraints. But this is the domain where those constraints aren't as rigid. So you can consider um, people who have a high level of expertise, say a couple of surgeons, um, may approach a similar problem differently. Perhaps there's contextual difference between the two patients that they might be considering, or there may be other factors. And that's completely fine. It doesn't have to be as rigid. They have the expertise to be able to adjust and adapt. And so that's the domain of, of good practice and that there's not um, one universal best practice. Um, and th this side of the, of the good diagram is where most of our research lives, uh, which Carmel will talk about a little bit later on perhaps. But this is where the, the area that we're used to and sort of a lot of the methodologies that we think of. Unfortunately, uh, that's not necessarily realistic for the rest of the real world where we actually happen to live. The bottom left part of the uh, diagram, the chaotic domain, um, is characterized by not having any effective constraints in play. So that means that there's no material relationship between cause and effect. Everything is without connectivity. Humans hate this space. This is always a temporary state. Um, where constraints are, are imposed quite quickly. And the upper left domain, which is where we all spend a lot of our time, is the complex domain. So this is where everything is entangled with everything else. 
So everything is constrained, but in all sorts of different ways, and there's high levels of uncertainty. In this domain, there's no repetition. Uh, there are, however, patterns, and you can respond to those patterns. So the thing that really matters in this space is the connections. And in this space, context is cru crucial. So the type of practice in the bottom left is novel practice. So this is in a highly tense, pressured, stressful environment where you have to do, it's a complete break with the familiar and you have to do something really novel. Um, the upper left is what we call exaptive. So this is where we have radical repurposing of things, not just about responding to patterns, but creating conditions where those radical repurposings are easier to stimulate, easier to recognize. So the, the image I think of this is the movie Apollo 13, where there was the climbing levels of CO2 in the space capsule and they had to jury rig a solution. So that's an example of exaptive or radical repurposing. And the key thing here is um, to repurpose things in which you already have confidence so you, the learning and energy needs are reduced. So the other thing about this diagram that you notice is that there's now this green line. And this green line is to twig us that this is not just an ontological frame. It's also about transitions, phase transitions. This is referred to as liminality. And it reflects energy gradients. So I'm not gonna get into this in a lot of detail, but it's an important element. The other thing that's new is this middle portion where it was initially it was domain of disorder and it then became confusion. Now it's called aporia and confusion on purpose. So in the confused part, in the gray part, it means you're confused and you don't know that you're confused. Uh, you're just sailing along thinking that things are carrying on in an ordered state that they were, but in fact, things have radically changed and you have included into it. Um, think perhaps early January with COVID-19 in a lot of jurisdictions. Um, a, aporia, is interesting. That's the space where you know that you're confused, but you're deliberately doing things to try to understand which domain you're in and what action you should be taking. So the graphic in the upper left corner um, explains a little bit about that notion. So you see on one where you're moving from the chaotic domain to the operative domain. So the example uh, for COVID-19 that uh, Professor Snowden uses is Jacinda Arden in New Zealand, cracking down with very, very tight constraints early. What that does, the application of those constraints early is it buys you time. It puts you into the operatic domain and gives you time to be able to figure out what the proper next move should be. Um, if you don't apply constraints, what we're seeing in other places in the world is a lot of tyrannical actors starting to step in with reactions to cha the chaotic space and applying constraints, which may be less desirable. Two is where you then move from the operatic domain into the complicated domain, into the realm of experts. So perhaps you have been ignoring the epidemiologists that you should have been ignoring, listening to initially. So this would be where you would engage with their help and listen and do what they tell you. Three would be if there was dispute between different experts and you needed to sort out which was the way, right way to go. So that's when you would move through three and try to create a structure where you try to understand which of those experts you should be thinking about. So an example could be in the UK between the behavioral economists and the epidemiologists and having a highly structured way to try to sort out what your next move should be. Four is when you have some really good hypotheses about what you should be doing that are well formed and you wanna move into doing some parallel fail to say, uh, safe to fail experiments uh, and try to move forward on those, that moves you back into the complex domain. And five is interesting. Five is when you don't have those hypotheses, but you know that someone out there probably um, does have some good ideas. The issue there is how do you figure out who those people are? So that's some new methodologies that exist in this space to try to sort that out. That's what five takes you. And six, you can't do. Next slide. So how do we then handle this space? How do we start to mobilize and find out what some of that information might be? So this is a useful graphic and the um, 
they've been transposed. The, right, the one on the right hand side is from Trisha Wang from her blog post. Um, and what it illustrates is the difference between big data and thick data. So big data is large volume data sets uh, where you gain access through algorithmic interpretation. Um, insights tend to be shallow. And the thing you have to be careful about here is that the algorithm training sets are, are based on training sets of data, which may um, introduce challenge. Thick data refers to um, intensive qualitative studies where you'll have low volumes of data, but they're very, very rich with high volumes of meaning, but it's very difficult to scale them. Rich data is the term that um, Dave has given to data that's in between that, where you have uh, the ability to have self-interpreted narrative at scale. So it's eff effectively quantifying qualitative material. And interestingly, what happens is you'll have patterns emerge in the data which are independent of the individual storyteller. And so they refer to that as rich data. And that really, um, the, the, this, the notion here is that when you're in this apparatic state, um, you really need to activate your human sensor network to do a situational assessment to discover previously unconsidered perspectives. Um, and you really want to try to uh, get very, very diverse perspectives in your rich data set. Next slide, please. So the example um, that I'm going to share with you is the Illuminate project. And, and the provenance of this project, this was a project that we were working on already with the community where we were, it was an understanding project, a participatory action research project where we were trying to understand in depth from the perspective of multiple different ethnocultural communities in Edmonton, um, what their perspectives were about obesity and diabetes, recognizing that both of those chronic diseases are intimately entwined in uh, social determinants of health. And that for us to be able to really move, make traction in terms of helping patients, we had to really understand what was going on. In that project, we were collaborating with the Multicultural Health Brokers Cooperative, which serves 27 different ethnocultural communities with over 10,000 people speaking 54 languages in our city. And they have a strong track record of uh, co-creating innovative and effective interventions with communities to address health and social needs. When COVID-19 hit, um, they asked us for help because uh, it really disrupted how they were working with people. So we got them set up on the Zoom and started doing a lot of different things to help them carry on with their activities. Um, but that's when we actually decided to do some sense-making work together. And that's where the AIM and the Illuminate project comes up in the upper left corner, which was to mitigate the serious health and social care consequences of COVID-19 in these communities by creating a novel system to feel feedback, real-time synthesized data to support sense making, making and guide the co-creation and refinement of grassroots um, interventions. Next slide, please. So the um, multicultural health brokers, uh, and as we've seen in the literature and in other jurisdictions, these were the urgent areas that emerged in our community. COVID-19 prevention and management, being able to get that information out to different language, uh, in different languages and different culturally appropriate ways, food insecurity, family violence, mental health, triggers of past trauma, maternal care, and care of non-COVID health conditions, uh, access to care. Next slide, please. So we created a tool, and this is just an example of the tool um, using the SenseMaker. Uh, which allows the individual, and we're working with a, a, about 20 different brokers in this project, where they will enter a micro narrative and um, based on experience that they've been having with a community member or with a group uh, or with an advocacy activity, and they give their experience a title and then they um, self signify it. So, this is really embracing this notion of epistemic justice, which is that the the analysis actually happens at the point of the person who's um, creating, uh, creating the narrative. So they explain what it means. And they'll do um, uh, different multiple choice questions or these triads, um, all of which are balanced and they'll move the stone to the place where it best fits. They can also choose not applicable. You'll see on the left side if it's not applicable to them. Next slide, please. So an example of the data that they will get, you'll, will get out of this looks like this. 
So these are color coded to the different areas. There's different ways you can look at this data and you'll see some of the different questions that um, the different stories would be signified on. So each dot is a story and that dot would appear in the different triads in different places depending on where the uh, person who was collecting the little narrative placed it. Uh, next slide please. So over time you'll see patterns emerge and you can interrogate it more. So in this slide, what we were interested in was uh, the macro portion in the bottom right corner. And we were looking at um, examples of where the multicultural health brokers were advocating uh, for system level change. And so you'll hear, see here small narratives about um, collaborative efforts at making housing insecurity vis visible to formal systems. One of the things the brokers feel frequently is that their efforts are invisible to the formal system and that the challenges are invisible. Uh, the second one is with the school board. The third one is linking with formal poverty research um, to create advocacy. The fourth is again around housing insecurity. Uh, and the fifth is around sustainable solutions for food insecurity. Next slide, please. So, sorry, let's go back one, thanks. So this is just an example, um, in the interest of time, we're just gonna show one, but this is just looking at family violence and mental health. And you can see how they cluster in the first uh, triad, very, very similar, the, the blue and the red, right? And then triad six, you can see very similar. On the right though, you can start to see some differences. So when you look at cause, risks caused by, at the top, the family violence is causing a lot of people to have to move. And when you look at those stories, you'll see stories about shelters and different things. Whereas in the bottom, uh, we'll see um, in social connections for resources used, mental health comes up there, but family violence doesn't. So we get together weekly and have sense maker discussions with the brokers about this and have discussions about the fact that actually this is a highly stigmatized thing, family violence, um, and that in their experience people will not talk about it. Similarly, um, some really useful insights about around the way that the ch Children's and Protective Services works, which is not working well for racialized minorities. So these kinds of gaps can become to the surface and then we can bring those to the uh, formal health and social care systems to see if we can try to affect some change. Next slide, please. So this is just a little bit of an example of some results, but um, one of the things we saw was a really unanticipated strong cluster around the activities that the brokers are helping with in the legal system, for example, helping people navigate the, the legal system. Uh, you can see here a number of things coming up with regards to COVID-19 and significant um, hardships that are materializing in the community and then some successes so one of the things is these communities are incredibly resilient um, and with a little bit of uh, support can actually have tremendous success and if we understand what those successes are then we may be able to scale them and make them visible to other communities and and um, try to make those successes spread thank you Thank you. So, um, so now we move on to the next area, which is policy. And uh, at a high level, um, a high level, a more a higher level view of this system. And I've used the mask because mask is very, is very controversial, uh, uh, particularly in the US where masks are such an issue. And Despite the fact that we have been through, we are now um, 10, 12 months or longer into this pandemic, masks still remain controversial. Despite the advances in pharmacological treatment uh, development and early vaccine development, reducing transmission of the virus with the use of face masks referring to medical or surgical masks, N95 or similar respirators, cloth masks and bandanas by healthcare workers and the public alike remains a hotly debated topic. This is due as much to the evidence as to the politicization of discourse and decision-making. Next slide. So before we progress, onto the policy of mask issues. Let us recap where we have come from today. The nature of SARS-CoV-2, 
the disease COVID-19, the consultation in the community. So my, using the Kinevan framework, but probably not the latest version, but the published version, um, we have mapped, um, we have mapped uh, 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 um, issues in, 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 the, in this framework to make, try to make sense of the various issues that would, 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 would um, contribute to masks, mask wearing. So, so basically we have started with the, the centre, which is the next slide. So this is picking up what Denise was talking about. And yes, it's unordered, uh, exactly using different words. First of all, it's unordered but also it's a space of possibilities. This is where um, negotiation, um, a, a sense making, the real sense making takes place. This is where the, we, move, we, we move between the known, the knowable, the adaptive and the fuzzy evidence and knowledge we have to, um, to make sense of, of, of the predicament that we're in of a way forward. So we have now mapped at each level, next slide, um, the key issues in each uh, quadrant. So in terms of evidence and knowledge, this is something that we can say we know, that it's repeatable, it's valid and reliable. It's constrained, it's a subject of a randomised, it could be in terms of methodology, this is where the randomised controlled trial, uh, mind you, the, the randomised controlled trial is meant to sit, although in reality, it's not that simple. So we, we look at, there's health domains, risk factors, which we know, age, sex, multimorbidity, um, uh, infection rate, we look at social risk factors, population, underprivileged. We look at um, past experiences, what we know about previous pandemics. What's, what, what, what are the facts? What are the facts that we bring to this? And what, are, what facts have we gleaned along the way? The next domain is the expert focused, where um, this is where it's knowable, but it's not straightforward. It's complicated. It's um, understanding the virus. Every day we're finding new things and then we're finding some contradictions, but we're finding new studies, anti role of retro, retrovirals, et cetera. We know about uh, social determinants. However, we don't know or we're learning about the, social, the effect of social determinants on gender on race, on poverty levels, on f issues of food insecurity, uh, unemployment. At the expert focus level, um, at the policy level, it, we look at vaccine development, screening, contact tracing, unemployment and economic decline. So these are all areas at different levels that are knowable. Now this isn't a gospel, we're just basically mapping, um, using um, sensing really, probe sense and response is what we're doing. And we're, we're trying to fit in what we know about the COVID epidemic into these domains. So the emergent domain is really, uh, and it's adaptive. So what do we do? What, how do we manage? So we've picked this up in the consultation how do we do it? The GP, the family doctor is always working in this emergent domain. And that is about, that is what the consultation uh, piece was about. In the future direction setting, the social and economic domain, that's, that's about the, more about the community and different community groups. That was in Denise's presentation. Getting back to the new normal is is something that everybody wants to do and decisions have been made with varying degree of evidence, um, new, new ways of new emergency strategies, but these are, are, are changing and, uh, but everyone wants to get back to normal. 
So the intuitive uncharted would be the crisis management, the what hits, what hits, what do you do when, when the pandemic hit? So we have Jacinda Ardern who locked everything down, which was easy being in a small country, which is very isolated from the rest of the world. And we have huge, um, you have Europe where every, all the borders are very porous and lockdown is, is, is more difficult and different strategies here. So this is crisis management. Um, it, nobody really knew the best answer. And, and we don't, still don't know. Um, we have um, various ways of understanding, but it all depends on the context. And we still don't understand uh, what's the best way to go in every situation, in every location. So um, this is where it's fuzzy. So, so just going back, so we need to work on this. So given that we've got all this type the evidence, the evidence from different domains, some of them might be um, a randomized controlled trial of which there aren't any, I believe there are some now, but they are limited on to mask, um, to mask for whom, how, when, where and why. So on that slide, so is there simple information we can make sense of mask wearing? No, there are no trials. Um, what the evidence has been pulled together using multiple different sources from past evidence um, on H1N1, on understanding about influenza, on droplet studies, on mask um, barriers, different types of mask barriers, barriers in different situations. So there's a lot of, um, so it becomes a complicated information that is pulled together. And that's the systematic reviews that have been done. So such as a recent one in the Lancet. There's fragmented evidence. There's emerging evidence. There's longitudinal evidence, but it's um, definitely complicated. In fact, it's probably more in the complex domain because the question is who should wear, when, when they should wear, what should they wear, why should they wear masks? And um, for example, in Australia, we have two states that are similar size. They're large states. They've got similar big cities, multi-ethnic communities. And one state has been on a, on a permanent lockdown for months. The other state has had similar numbers of cases uh, and they have just managed with um, hotspotting and advising to wear masks in certain situations, whereas it's mandated in, other, in an, the other state. So if how many cases in your community do you have to have when you should start wearing a mask? Should you wear, wear masks all the time? So there's a lot of politics here. And really why we've got to this is because this, um, the COVID was come in, came in at, in the unordered space and, and it was chaotic. It created chaotic information. There were all sorts of reports about masking, not masking. It might make more transmission. Uh, it would use valuable resources. Um, we, we are now getting more understandings. For example, the WHO has come up with some, an algorithm of recommendation. But again, it says, um, whatever strategy you take, um, there are potential risks and disadvantages that should be taken into account in any decision. Um, Non-medical fabric masks could increase potential for COVID-19 infection if the mask is contaminated. It can cause difficulty in breathing, panic attacks in people with lung problems. They can lead to facial skin background and difficult to wear. So that um, it's still, we're still, we're still in somewhat of a chaotic environment in relation to masks. Next slide. So how do we, how do we take a step back and looking at this 
sense making and multiple ways of knowledge and knowing. So there are many different studies that could be done around masks. We can look at, we could do a trial, we could do a qualitative study and interview people on the experiences of wearing masks. We could model the use of masks in numbers of people in the population infected. We could look at the philosophy of masks, you know, how are we um, impacting on individual freedom by mandating masks and then fining people and even putting them into jail if they really break the rules. How do we understand the uh, social, uh, so, uh, how people construct masks? For example, in Australia, multi-ethnic communities see masks um, or the fo being forced to wear masks as some sort of imposition of a, of a government because they don't actually understand why uh, it hasn't been explained to them. Cognitive science, communication studies, how do we, how do we explain to people these complex uh, dilemmas, uh, et cetera. So, th these, so there's multiple ways of looking and multiple ways of understanding even something that should be a binary yes, no use of masks. While these discourses cannot deliver a certainty, they offer the best chance to develop the best adaptive solutions that can ultimately involve, resolve problems. So the next slide is a, a framework that we developed for family doctors and other health professionals to look at the ways of understanding a complex system. So it's paring down the types of knowledge. So the simple and complicated domains are suited to evidence, to trials, to longitudinal studies, typical research tools. Um, complicated if, if it's longitudinal and you're putting context in, simple if it's a simple yes, no, dichotomous outcome. For complex systems, we need um, sense-making and knowledge. We need to glean knowledge from different ways, multiple ways of knowing. But somehow or other, we need to put them all together. And that's the beauty of the Kenevan framework and this, this making sense, the unordered space. So, if we, if, so the WHO, for example, is calling on world leaders to get together and there's some coalitions and people working, countries working well together, whereas others are going in completely different directions. One of the issues in the pandemic has been the dominance of the population health perspective, the epidemiological perspective, without bringing in the other ways of knowing from the other disciplines. And if we can, can if we can continue to uh, work in this area and integrate, we can in fact move back from the edge of chaos, which is an old term, but I think a good term, and make sense and understand more. And, and it's all about discourse, dialogue, respect, and multiple perspectives. So thank you very much. Um, I've now wonder whether anybody would like to ask any questions or make any comments. We have a couple of questions, Carmel, in the chat. Um, okay. Marjorie uh, was saying, this is so interesting, but it's unlikely there'll be a return to what we thought of as normal. So I don't know, uh, Joachim or Bruno, if you have thoughts on that. Well, I think it, it's a very interesting question to ask what is normal. Uh, it, essentially, normal is what, what we have experienced and uh, we only know that it was normal when there's disruption uh, so that we realize. Um, will there be a new normal? Yeah, I would say, yes, there will be, uh, simply because any emergent process will lead to a new state. And that new state is what we call the new normal. And we will then just get used to it uh, and tacitly embrace it uh, without thinking about it. 
if you mm -hmm. extend the question and ask me uh, what will it look like, uh, my answer is my guess is as good as yours. Um, uh, they, we, we cannot uh, uh, know the future. We only can uh, uh, see how it develops uh, step by step. Uh, and we have a chance uh, by being uh, co-producers of the future uh, to uh, shape it according to our beliefs or insights uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Constance has an interesting uh, question and then she just put in a dead name. But she was uh, commenting on around masking, there's contextual features for the general practice. For example, in expecting mask wearing in a rural general practice where there's never been a COVID case is based on a different risk assessment from expecting mask wearing where there's been a hotspot currently. And she says she's uh, from New South Wales that uses hotspotting and contact tracing and gives an addendum as well um, uh, around other aspects um, that could impinge such as cultural factors, affordability of masks, whether insisting on mask wearing Will result in a drop of patients and economic damage to the practice. Um, so I guess both uh, Carmel, you and Joachim are both in Australia. Um, did you have any sort of reaction to Constance's question? I, I would, I'll answer on that. I mean, I think it's uh, um, going back to the complex domain and the issue of risk perception and um, possibly even political outlook. Um, the, uh, for example, in Queensland, which is another state, I think we had a few cases in one school and nursing home and the whole of the southeast Queensland, which is a huge geographic area, it was manda mandated that all doctors, general practitioners and patients in their surgeries had to wear masks. So um, I agree that I wonder where the science is there. I don't think there's any science there. I think this is a, an ad hoc uh, decision related to crisis management in the chaotic zone. You know, what do we do? Well, we've talked about this hotspotting. What do we do? How far do we, um, you know, how far does the ring spread? Who should be involved? Uh, and what is my political worldview? You know, am I a as someone who believes a little bit of laissez-faire or do I believe in control and command and control, um, sort of more top-down hierarchical. So I thank you for that comment and I think that is a perfect example of going into the chaotic and complex with very little in the um, simple and com complicated domain to guide the decision. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I, I think this fear is sort of one of the drivers of many things. Uh, are you as fearful of um, winning lotto if you play, where the chances are very low, uh, or why, why, if in, in, in overall epidemiological terms, uh, there, there are, in, at least in Australia, and, and, uh, very few uh, cases of COVID that are spread around um, in small clusters. If you have risk perceptions in a uh, more logical understanding, it would mean that people in a hotspot should take care because they are at an increased risk. I think the other part that comes into it is to, uh, to understand what we already know. Not everyone is at the same risk. Uh, if you are an elderly person living in a, a residential aged care facility, your risk is extremely high. And we know from the Swedish experience uh, that had a, a fairly soft go uh, on it, that 95% of all the deaths that occurred in the country occurred in uh, the nursing home community. And they now recognized uh, uh, very openly that they didn't spot that early enough to um, uh, uh, put proper prevention into place. So it, it, in the end, is the dynamics in the complex domain uh, is to sense all the time what's going on, to 
evaluated uh, and put different proposals uh, forward that need to be that that can only meaningfully be implemented in context bruno do you have anything on that in switzerland what's um what's the perspective there uh, on constance's question you're on mute bruno I'm unmuted. So in Switzerland, we have a rising, very, very rapidly rising number of infections, but uh, we have not a rising, a really rising number of deaths. And the government now decided that uh, everybody has to take masks in rooms, inside rooms, and they limited the number of, of people they can collect. And I think it is not sure about if the masks help, but no masks and no distance does not help. And so I think it is really important to say to the people that they can understand what happens, that they can understand that it is not sure, really sure, if this helps, but it is what we can do. And when, they, when, when the government is honest, and tells about the limits of such measures, then I think more people can understand it and be compliant and also maybe positively critic and not negatively critic. N nobody knows. And how to decide in a not knowing situation and you have to do something. All the, all the countries, they did nothing. They had really bad results in the beginning. And so mm -hmm. in this, all everybody's observed in the public. And I think a politician do, uh, is no more able to do nothing. And so the understand to, uh, to, to further the understanding is the most important thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, in our jurisdiction, we immediately pivoted to virtual. And uh, we still do a ton of screening before anyone will come into clinic anybody with a shred of symptom comes into our isolation room through a separate entrance and anybody coming in the regular clinic is masked and we're masked all the time and the major overwhelming concern with all of that has been uh, the prevention of spread to the medical care facilities so that we can preserve medical care functions for all the normal daily work that we do in our 100 percent full hospitals um, and you know, that's the big overwhelming concern. At the beginning, there was really scary projections of what would happen if we had an Italy event here uh, because we don't have the same kind of ICU capacity. Uh, and that was the big concern with ensuring that people were masking in healthcare spaces. Plus, a lot of the pe people that we see are vulnerable people. You know, the people that actually have to come to clinic are patients like Bruno's patient who, you know, have a lot of comorbidities. And so none of us want to be a vector uh, to those people. And so we're very careful. Um, but that was the consideration here. And it's uh, so far, knock on wood, okay, but we've got right now, even today, two outbreaks in two of our hospitals, which are very worrisome. So um, we have to stay vigilant. And as you say, Bruno, um, whether or not it's perfect, uh, it's something. And you know, hopefully at the end of this, we won't have to have any more hand washing campaigns. It's always amazed me how many hand washing campaigns we have to have in the hospital. Hopefully at the end of this, we won't have to have hand washing campaigns. So, Joseph Miguel uh, Buena Ortez has a question. Uh, on behalf of the Wonka Working Party on Quality and Safety, congrats on this very interesting webinar. What do you think will be the impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning on COVID tackling and family medicine in the next 10, next 10 years, and on quality and patient safety and on complexity? So that's a question we could have another webinar about, but does anybody feel that they, um, can tackle a piece of Joe's uh, question? I'll jump in here. Um, I actually think that um, if family medicine sets itself up as a, with a modern information technology and we move from just being individual practices and have a whole you know, network of our data systems, our practice data uh, linked, uh, I think we can, we can, it, it would be useful. I would definitely think it would be useful. 
Um, I, um, in one of my projects that I'm doing, we have done uh, on our narratives, but it using a different um, approach. Um, we have used machine learning and uh, that pr helps predicting a risk of readmission. And in another place in Victoria, they've used the patient, um, the medical records, the me linked medical records and done uh, other predictions on at risk patients, etc. So I definitely think that while it may be thin data, uh, because we don't reject the simple domain or the complicated domain, we embrace all of them, that there's useful data. It, data mining can be useful, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just to add on to that, uh, uh, the uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory um, has taken all the data available on COVID uh, and has over the, uh, a week of processing these data come up with, an, uh, I'd say it in inverted commas, best explanatory model on uh, how uh, COVID works. Uh, and at the biomedical uh, level, it is not cytokine storm, but bradykine storm uh, that uh, is the underlying explanatory mechanism according to their data. So I think in, while I'm not see, seeing it, uh, that, that AI is a tool in general practice, but it's certainly a tool to better understand the phenomena <coughs> the phenomena at uh, a, a broader global level. Uh, but you can call me old fashioned um, I'm believing in the art of medicine more than in, than, than in uh, some form of uh, uh, scientific. I don't, I'm going to jump in here. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. We've just been looking at the Kinefin framework and we're accepting all the different, we're not saying that this complicated, it's poor the complicated domain. We're not rejecting that. Uh, and I do think that pool general practice data is, is very useful. And, um, I, I... <laughs> and I'm not, but I'm not rejecting the person centered consultation. I don't think it should, do, it's not going to destroy that. But what it will do is give us sort of a slightly another level of knowledge about our practices. Yeah, at the practice level, but I, what, what I'm was re more referring to is, does it help us in the management of the patient in the consultation at this point in time? And I have doubts about that. Well, the answer mm -hmm. would be no, but in terms of quality and safety across our family medicine practices. I totally agree. Yes. It will. Yes. Yeah. And Bruno, that's where, where, where context comes into it. Exactly. Bruno, did you want to chime in on that? You're on mute again. Yes, I know. I think I agree with uh, Joachim. Um, it is good to have um, this uh, data and machine learning, but in the practice, in front of the patient, it is difficult. It can give more information, but information is one thing, but you must find solutions with the patient and to go to uncertainty and ambivalence and there is the, the knowing of the machine is one thing, but the individual solution with his beliefs, with his uh, individual goals, this is really art of medicine. It can be supported by the machine, but in the end, it's handwork. Mm -hmm. So I, I co-lead a program. I put the, in the chat the link for our webpage called albertaplp.ca and it's an interesting it's an interesting entity it's an evidence translation hub effectively uh, where we have the mandate of getting in front of docs and teams across all disciplines uh, to try to tackle the problems that if we were to change what we were doing would make a difference for albertans um, and interesting in that office i have we have access to all available data in alberta um, and what's fascinating is how incredibly difficult it is to work with. Um, uh, we have, I think, something on the order of 28 different data sets that are not connected. 
Uh, my team has had to learn Python to be able to pull those databases together. When we have clinical questions, it's really difficult to find out where the data is and pull it all together. And uh, one of the things we find is that there's a lot of lack of discipline in coding and the taxonomies people are using are not necessarily the correct taxonomies. So, you know, I think that the idea of doing machine learning in AI is fascinating, but I really wonder whether the data is actually in a state to be able to do that yet. I think we've got some work to do up front um, to try to help uh, all of us understand that we're moving from taking care of the individual patient in front of us to taking care of a panel of patients. And so that data discipline actually matters. And do the tools that we actually work in and code in, do they actually support us being able to do that work in the flow of our day to day? Because if they're incredibly cumbersome and very hard to use, then um, it's going to be really difficult to get the quality of data that we would need. And those are the data sets we would need to have to train AI and to train machine learning. So I think there's some areas where they're getting at it, like with syndemic coding for certain reports and things. But on the whole, I think we've got a lot of work to do. A lot of but work I think I think we should do it. I actually think we should oh, do yeah. it. I th I think I, that um, yeah. I I think that um, so my experience in practice, a lot of my time is spent going through complicated patient records and letters from specialists and. Um, I, I think we can do a lot better with our uh, practice um, IT systems. Uh, but I'm, on the other hand, I'm a, you know, hand on my heart, I'm a patient-centered doctor, but I believe that, I believe in, the, in all the domains of the Kinefin framework. I believe if there's a trial, and there's not many, that will really inform my practice, then I will recognize that most of it's going to be complicated longitudinal studies uh, some of the AI is just I mean AI is just really a tool it's um, it's a data modeling tool and you know it uses things like logistic regression and all those old linear modeling so there's AI and AI and AI and but some of that we can run that's useful um, to get into the complex area, there's much more sophistication and you have to use other tools. But I think that we, um, I think we need to do it, but it shouldn't be destroying our clinical care. Being focused on what matters. Mm -hmm. That's the real uh, point that is missing in virtually all of our uh, public discourses. It's all about self-interest currently, but we are not um, uh, uh, individuals. We are in the end uh, a society and we need so societal solutions. And they will be vary from place to place. And even within the same place, they may vary very much between uh, uh, smaller local communities. And we need to accept that every complex problem has mutually agreeable solutions. None of them is right, none of them is wrong. It's always the best adapted or the most adapted solution under the local constraints. I think the other thing that it's brought out, it's brought out is in every time there's a major crisis, a certain set of the population managed to get richer and get more control of society and the most vulnerable people are most affected. And uh, it exposes the inequity, this crisis has exposed the inequity of um, mm -hmm. our society and made it worse. Mm -hmm. There was a great quote in the Washington Post in April, which I keep on my computer, which um, was from uh, Kirsten Han. And it said, recent developments have demonstrated you can't have foresight for things that you refuse to see. And I love that quote. That's why I keep it on my computer because um, the one thing about a crisis is it's putting into sharp relief all the things that we've refused to see. So hopefully we will have to now deal with it. And we've got a lot to deal with. So anyway, Joachim is, is saying we have to close. This has been so fun. Yes. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. And, uh, Hopefully we stimulated um, uh, everyone to join into uh, 
the complexity family uh, to tackle the problems that matter. Thank yeah. you very much. The Coalition of the Winging, Willing. <laughs> the Coalition of the Willing. Please join us. Yeah. Fine. Uh, just a reminder that the next uh, session in this series will be on the 25th of October. Mm -hmm.